So um, uh, as I discussed yesterday, the, the, the topic for today is going to be state discrimination. Okay, so the question is, uh, I have two or even more states and I would like to distinguish between them. And so uh, what is the optimal way of doing this and what are the different regimes of interest uh, for this question? This is what we'll look at today. Okay, so we'll start with something that I'm guessing also most of you uh, are familiar with. Uh, is uh, maybe the, the most famous distance measure between states, it's the trace distance. Okay, and we'll see uh, how this relates to, to state discrimination. Okay, so let's, let's do that. So um, uh, the trace distance between two quantum states, rho and sigma, uh, is defined by as the following, so I'll, I'll denote it by delta between the two states, rho and sigma, as one half of the one norm between rho and sigma. So what I mean by this is I take the sum of the absolute value of the eigenvalues of rho minus sigma. Okay, you can also write it like this. Um, so let's see a few properties of, uh, of this trace distance. So it's between zero and one, and it's zero if and only if rho is equal to sigma. Uh, so it's a, it's a valid distance. Uh, it's invariant under unitary transformation. So if I apply the same unitary to the two states, the distinguishability, be, uh, the distance between them doesn't change. Uh, if I restrict myself to the classical case, okay, so in other words, if rho and sigma are commuting uh, and there is a common eigenbasis, okay, so that I'm denoting A here, okay, and so the eigenvalues are uh, uh, probability vector P of A and Q of A for sigma, then this uh, trace distance just becomes uh, the following, so one half of the sum of P of A minus Q of A, absolute value. Okay, and this is again uh, very well used in, uh, used a lot in uh, probability theory and it's called sometimes the total variation distance or the statistical distance between the two distributions P and Q. Okay, what other important properties uh, are satisfied by this, by this uh, distance measure uh, is what I will call the data processing inequality. Okay, and this is an inequality which is really fundamental for any um, uh, distance measure in general. And uh, this may be the most fundamental uh, inequality of a distance measure, and we'll, we'll see it, we'll see this uh, inequality several times for the different, for different measures we'll introduce during uh, this lecture. Okay, so what do I mean by data processing? It just means that if I process further my two states with the same map, then the distance between them can only decrease, okay? Or their distinguishability can only decrease. Okay, so, uh, so what is a valid physical process here? It's a quantum channel, as we uh, saw yesterday. So it's modeled by a quantum channel that I denote E. And uh, the trace distance, uh, uh, when I apply channel E, uh, the same channel E to the two states can only decrease. Okay, good. So why is the, this total variation distance or the trace distance playing such an important role and why, why do we use the one norm and not, for example, some other, the two norm or some, some other uh, uh, notions of distance? Okay, so the main reason is that it has a very natural uh, operational interpretation, okay, in terms of distinguishing between the two states, rho and sigma. Okay, so what is, the what is the setting for state discrimination or, or distinguishing between states is the following, is that uh, I have a quantum system A, okay, and I know it's in one of two states, right? So I, or I have two hypotheses about the state of the system. Okay, so I know that the hypothesis, which I'll call zero, is that the, the system is in the state rho zero, okay? Or the, the hypothesis one is that it's in the state rho one. And the question is that I would like to, so um, I would like to know in which setting I am. So is it hypothesis zero or hypothesis one that is true? Okay, and I have access to uh, the, the, the system A. Okay, and so I want to, uh, so uh, what is my task here is it's to try to, uh, to achieve this distinguishing with a minimum error probability. Okay, so, uh, so what is a strategy? What do I have? What, 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 what is the thing that I can do in order to, do to, uh, to, to achieve this task is that because I have access to my system A, I have to do some sort of valid quantum operation 
which uh, allows me to say, am I in hypothesis zero or in hypothesis one? Okay. And so it turns out, as we saw yesterday, the, the most general way of, uh, of modeling that is a POVM with just two outcomes, zero and one, right? Because my objective is to just, uh, is just to output either zero or one, hypothesis zero or hypothesis one. Okay, and so this is modeled by POVM, uh, E0 and E1. So as you saw, that, uh, as remember, so E0 and E1 should do both be positive operators that sum to the identity. Um, okay. So, uh, okay, so there is uh, various different uh, error probabilities you can look at. And so for now, as a start, I'll, I'll look at uh, uh, a simple measure, which you can call the average error probability which is that I'll put a prior on my hypothesis that I assume that with probability a half, it's uh, H0, which is correct, and I with probability a half, it's H1. Okay. As we'll see later, this is not necessarily the case. It depends on the applications. But let's think of this natural setting where we look at the average error probability. Okay, so in this case, if I put this prior, then let's see what is my total error probability. Okay, so... Uh, my error probability is uh, one half. Okay, so this one half corresponds to uh, H0 being true. So to the fact that I'm in hypothesis H0, which means that my state, the correct state, is row zero. Okay, so what is the error probability in this case? The error probability is that I output one. Okay, so that's why I say it's the trace of E1 times row zero. Okay, so this is the... The probability, again, I, I wrote it here, that the state is row zero, but we wrongly say that, our, my procedure wrongly says that uh, it's H1, okay? This is sometimes we call it the type one error, okay? This is one of the two types of errors. And then there is the other type of error, that the true state is row one, but I say uh, zero. Okay, so this again is the type two error. Okay, so I should say that often, so here H0, you see in, in the expression, even it's clear in the expression that H0 and H1 play a symmetric role, but often case, uh, of often, it's often the case that um, uh, H0 and H1 do not play a symmetric role. And this is actually what we'll see in Stein's, le in Stein's lemma in a bit, that H0 will, will, will treat H0 and H1 differently. Okay, so yeah, so uh, let's go back to the to the trace distance. So, what's the relation between the trace distance and this question of discriminating between two states, row zero and row one? So, it turns out that the the minimum error probability that I can achieve. So, if I optimize over all possible E zeros and, and E one over all po possible POVMs, then the minimum error probability is given uh, exactly by this trace distance. Okay, and the uh, uh, the quantity is exactly this quantity. It's one half minus one half the trace distance between row zero and row one. Um, okay, so this, I, I won't prove it. This is one of the problems in the, the problem session. Okay, good. So, uh, so that was for the trace distance. So let's now get to uh, um, the, let's say, the more general setting where uh, now I want to understand the fundamental trade-off between the two types of errors. Okay, so now I want to not just understand what is the, the minimum of the average of the two errors, I want to understand really the trade-off. Okay, so, so if I fix, let's say, the type 1 error to be at most epsilon, what can I say on the type 2 error? Okay. And so uh, in order to, to understand this, it, uh, it will be useful uh, for this lecture um, to introduce a quantity that, that quantifies this, and, and it exactly quantifies this thing. is Given a fixed type 1 error, what can I say on the type 2 error? Okay. Um, so it p it's parameterized in, in, some, uh, um, in some way, but uh, to, to make it look like a divergence, but it's, it's only saying that. Okay, so, so let's go over this definition. So I will call it, this I will call it the hypothesis testing relative entropy. Okay, or also divergence. I will use divergence and relative entropy interchangeably. Okay, so it has some parameter epsilon. Okay, you should think of this parameter epsilon as exactly the type one error probability I aim at achieving. Okay, and it's defined by uh, the following expression. Okay, so for fixed rho and sigma, it depends on rho and sigma, and it has some parameter epsilon. 
and uh, I just maximize or minimize the type 2 error probability. And, but, but here, the way I'll parameterize it is that I'll maximize minus log of the type 2 error probability. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so this condition corresponds to the fact that the type 1 uh, error probability is at most epsilon. Okay, uh, the, my P of EM, remember, E0 and E1, it's given by just uh, E and identity minus E. And yeah, E corresponds to E0. Okay, and so this exactly corresponds to the, the minimum type 2 error I can achieve. Okay, so a few, a few remarks on this. Um, uh, so notice that uh, this quantity is between 0 and plus infinity. Okay, because this is between 0 and 1. Uh, yeah, so if this is 0, then I just, uh, this is counted as, as, as plus infinity. And as I previously said, so multiple times even, is that 2 to the minus this uh, hypothesis testing divergence is the minimum type 2 error if I fix the type 1 error to uh, at most epsilon. Uh, so let's look at um, some like border cases. Okay, so if I fix the type 1 error to, to at most, uh, if I fix epsilon to 1, then this is not putting any constraint, and so of course I can get plus infinity in this definition. Okay. Uh, if I pick epsilon equal to 0, right, then uh, I have to have here the trace of e times rho is equal to 1. Right, so what I have to do to, uh, for e, I have to, to pick e to be uh, to be the whole support of rho, right? At least the whole support of rho. Okay. And um, uh, so this gives me this quantity, right? So minus log of trace of the projector onto the support of rho times sigma. Okay. And uh, yeah, so something maybe the support that because this will come back again. Uh, so. Uh, when I say the support of rho, or the projector onto the support of rho, I just mean the sum of the uh, uh, projector onto EI, where EI is an eigenvector with a non-zero eigenvalue of rho. Uh, okay, so yeah, another setting of interest is uh, when rho is equal to sigma. Okay, so this is supposed to be a distance measure, right? When rho is is, is close to sigma, we expect this quantity to be small. Okay, so for rho is equal to sigma, it doesn't give you exactly zero, but uh, uh, it gives you something which is close to zero as epsilon goes to, as for epsilon small. Okay, so, uh, okay, another remark is that if rho and sigma uh, have orthogonal supports, uh, then it's very easy to distinguish them. You just uh, uh, take the projector onto, onto the support of rho, let's say, for, for E, then you get plus infinity. Okay, so um, hope this gives you an idea of, of, of this quantity. So um, uh, let's uh, make a few further um, uh, remarks about this. Um, so yeah, in general, so I wrote uh, the way I define this, this quantity is, is via an optimization problem, right? Um, and uh, this, in general, this optimization problem does not have a closed form expression, right? So you have to optimize over all these different E's. But uh, you may notice that this is a nice problem in the sense that it's a convex optimization problem. And more precisely, it's even a semi-definite program, uh, right? So the constraints are uh, some operators being positive semi-definite. Okay, so this can be computed efficiently in, ge in general okay, as a function of the dimension of the, of the systems that are present. Okay, good. So uh, to get maybe a little bit more intuition, maybe it's useful to consider the classical case. Right? So if I take rho and sigma to be uh, diagonal in the same basis, okay, I called it x here, okay, so and p and q are the corresponding uh, probability vectors, then what would be a natural test, right? So I want to test whether um, uh, I have P or Q, okay? What will be, in this case, a natural test? We didn't talk about tests so far, uh, but uh, so maybe this is a good point to, um, to, to talk about um, uh, how I would test whether I, get I, ha I have distribution P or distribution Q. Um, 
Okay, so I, I claim here that the natural test, and this is used a lot, is to, uh, if you get the sample x, okay, because what is a test doing, right? It's getting a sample x, and it should output, do I have p or q? Okay, so a natural test, and th this is what actually we'll use in a minute, is that we compute this ratio, p of x over q of x. Okay, and so the natural thing to say is that if this ratio is bigger than one, or bigger than some, some threshold value, okay, which will determine depending on the problem, I will output p, and if it's below some threshold, uh, this th same threshold value, I'll output q. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I hope this gives a, a general idea of, of, of this quantity. So, okay, so let's, let's uh, prove, um, so I remember I told you that uh, an important property of a given uh, distance measure is the data processing inequality, right? Um, so saying, for, uh, for example, that if I forget some part of my system, then I shouldn't lose in terms of distinguishability. Okay, and so here, uh, for this quantity, it does satisfy the data processing inequality, and it's relatively simple to show. So, uh, yeah, the statement here is that satisfies the data processing inequality, and again, I remind you that this uh, just says that for any quantum channel, if I apply this channel to rho and to sigma, then the, the, the this distance measure can only decrease. Okay. Said this several times, so I don't need to repeat it. Okay, so, so how do we prove this? This is very simple. So I will take an optimal E. Remember, our divergence is defined in terms of a, an optimization problem. So if I define E to be the, the um, uh, E for the problem corresponding to E of rho and E of sigma, right, then uh, by construction, so the hypothesis testing entropy between E of rho and E of sigma is minus log trace of E times E of sigma, right? And I have, of course, as a constraint, it should satisfy the trace of E times the channel E applied to rho is at least one minus epsilon. I just use the definition, okay? And so, um, okay, so now what I will do is I will construct uh, an, uh, an E prime, if you want, for the optimization problem corresponding to rho and sigma. Okay, so how will I do that? There is a very natural choice. And uh, so uh, this uses this, uh, this idea of the adjoint of um, uh, a quantum channel E, which you saw in the problem session yesterday. For those who didn't reach this, uh, so I can see uh, the set of linear operator as a Hilbert, sp Hilbert space itself, so I can define an inner product, and so I can use exactly the same definition, remember, of, of, a, of an adjoint that I defined uh, for an, a regular operator. I can also do it for a super operator. Okay, and so, um, so by using this property of the, of the adjoint of, of a map E, I can and, and take this the, the trace of E times uh, the map E applies to sigma. Remember, this is the quantity which appears here. Okay. Sigma. So, okay, what's the natural thing to do is that I just put this operator, uh, uh, apply its adjoint on the, on the operator E. Okay. So, uh, by using also the fact that E is Hermitian, you get that the trace of E times uh, the channel E applied to sigma is equal to the trace the adjoint of E applied to the operator E times the operator sigma. Okay. To rho as well, right? And so if you remember from the, from the problem session from yesterday, so if E is completely positive, then the adjoint is also completely positive, and this is if and only if. And um, for the trace preserving property, this is equivalent to the unital property if I go to the adjoint. Okay, and remember, unital just means maps identity to, to identity. Okay, so, so, uh, so what do I have to show? So now the, the I have a natural candidate for the optimal or, or for one feasible choice for uh, the, the operator uh, E for the problem between rho and sigma. It will be just uh, uh, the, the adjoint E star applied to the operator E. Maybe I should have chosen a different name for, but okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so I, I, I choose this E star applied to E, 
and it satisfies the property that it's between zero and an identity. Remember, this was the constraint in my problem. Uh, so if I go back, I should now verify that I satisfy these constraints. I satisfy this, and I satisfy this. Okay, that E star of E satisfies this. And so I just check these two conditions, uh, right? So E star of E is between, is positive, right? Because my map is completely positive, and it's uh, at most uh, E star of identity, which is a self-identity because E star is uh, unitary. Okay, and so, uh, yeah, also the, the condition of being bigger than, than one minus epsilon follows immediately from here. Um, and so I get that uh, E star of E is a feasible solution for the prog program, for the, the, the program that defines this quantity, okay? And so I have that um, uh, the, uh, the this quantity is at least the value which is given by this fixed feasible solution that I gave you. Okay. Okay. So uh, this proves the um, the data processing for this um, uh, hypothesis testing relative entropy. Okay. I hope this was clear. I try to go relatively slow so that uh, you follow this calculation. Um, Okay, good. So, okay, so now I will look at a uh, uh, special case of interest. So, okay, so here I just gave you a quantity which tells me what is the type 2 with respect to the type 1. We, we just saw uh, a way of writing it and, and a few of its properties. So now we will look at, at the specific setting which comes uh, of, of interest and whether we can say more about this quantity, whether we can say more about what is the trade-off between type 1 and type 2. Okay, and so the specific uh, setting of interest that I will look at is imagine that I have multiple copies of uh, rho and sigma. Okay, so imagine that I have a box, right, which uh, I, when I press the button, it either gives me rho or it gives me sigma. Okay, and I want to know, and I can press, the, I can use the, the, this box several times, right? So I can use it n times and think of n as being very large. Okay, and I want to know whether I'm in the setting where the box outputs rho or it outputs sigma. No, 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 it's not half-half. No, no, here, uh, so from the start when I defined this, uh, um, this hypothesis testing relative entropy, uh, I, I look really at the two quantities, okay? So I, I don't put any prior on, uh, the, uh, on, on row zero or row one, on the, on the two hypotheses. I just say that, uh, I, okay, I have row zero, or I have here, I call it row and sigma, and for any strategy, I have a type one error and a type two error. So I have these two numbers, and of course there, there's a tension between these two numbers. I cannot get both of them to be zero in general, okay? Um, uh, and uh, my, okay, so again, the trace distance was saying that if I want to minimize half of this number plus half of this number, okay? What is the minimum that I can achieve? Now I, I will ask a different question, and this is what, what we'll do in Stein's lemma, is assume the first number is at most epsilon, what can I say on the second number, on the second error probability? Okay, so as I told you, so this is a setting which is not symmetric between the two types of errors, right? So, and this, this does happen a lot, that the, the two types of errors, like the false positives and the po false negatives, they're not always symmetric. Uh, I sometimes want this to be much smaller. And uh, so, um, yeah, so here I will fix one of the two errors to be a constant epsilon, constant at most epsilon, and I look at the other error and I will look more specifically how it behaves as a function of n, right? So remember that I look at the setting where uh, I have rho tensor n and sigma tensor n, and uh, I fix one of the two errors to be at most epsilon, which is just a fixed parameter, which I see as a constant, and I look at the other one, naturally it will go down with n, right? So as I have more copies, as I can use my box more times, I can distinguish more easily, right, between the, the two situations. And so the other uh, kind of error probability will go down as n goes to infinity. And the question that we'll ask exactly is how quickly does it go to zero? Okay, as, as, as n goes to infinity. Okay, and so, so this is exactly the statement of, um, of quantum Stein's lemma, right? So it's, uh, so again, I fix, uh, one, uh, I fix my epsilon, a fixed constant, and I take rho and sigma Okay, and I look at um, 
uh, rho tensor n and sigma tensor n, right? And so uh, remember, uh, this quantity is, um, so dh of epsilon, I take it as the log of the error probability, right? Or minus the log of the error probability, right? So uh, here, what I'm doing is that, uh, what, what, what we'll show is that the second error probability goes down to, to, uh, to zero exponentially, and I want to know exactly what is the rate of it going down exponentially, right? So uh, again, recall, so the, f the, the first type of error is at most epsilon, the second type of error, type two error, goes to zero exponentially in n, and I want to understand what is the exponent exactly. And uh, what Stein's lemma is saying is exa it, it exactly characterizes what is this exponent, okay? And it's given exactly in terms of the quantum relative entropy, which I'll define in a minute, okay? So uh, again, the one over n is to say that I look at the, at the constant in front of the, like the error goes down as, as uh, two to the minus some constant times n. And so I, I look at this constant and it will be given by this uh, quantum relative entropy. Yes. Uh, the rate of convergence. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, yeah, of of course, as as epsilon goes to uh, as epsilon goes to zero, the the convergence is slower. But we actually understand quite well the convergence in the sense that. Um, uh, so we even understand like the second order term, right? So uh, we know that here it's completely independent of epsilon. The first order term is completely independent of epsilon. And then if you want to be more precise here, um, and you just don't look at the limit, but say one over n, this is equal plus one over square root n times some quantity which depends on epsilon here. Okay, so... Uh, in some sense, the first order term does not depend on epsilon, and this is what uh, appears here because I, I said it's, it works for any epsilon, but uh, the second order term depends on epsilon. So, um, yes. Uh, the dependence on the dimension, uh, uh, I mean, so the second order term has a, so, uh, I mean, but, but in what, uh, it, it depends on actually the states themselves here, so, 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 but this quantity can be infinite, right? So, uh, or, so yeah, the, the, the okay, so here, uh, here usually in these expressions, the dimension does not appear explicitly, right? So you, we, we look really at the fixed rho and sigma and we want a, a quantity which really depends on just rho and sigma. And so in the, in the first order term, what appears is, the, is this uh, quantum relative entropy. And in the second order term, there is, uh, there is a term which depends on epsilon and uh, a term which depends on some variance of uh, between rho and sigma. But the dimension does not explicitly appear. Okay. Good. Okay, any further questions about the statement? Because, okay, so the, what we'll do in the remainder of the lecture is to try to prove this statement. Um, okay, so I'll go a little bit quickly probably over the proof, but uh, yes. Uh, so, most so, yeah, so the classical one, yeah, good question. So the classical one is exactly the case where uh, rho and sigma are uh, probability distributions. Or if you want rho and sigma commute, okay, so they... they they are. They can be diagonalized in a uh, in the same basis, and so yeah. You, you take two. It's exactly the same question, right? So you have uh, the box, and now it outputs a sample, okay, from P or from Q, and you want to distinguish between them. And yeah. Okay. Further questions. Okay. Good. So. Um, <coughs> okay, so now I have to, to tell you what the quantum relative entropy is. I didn't say that yet. So, um, okay, so what is the quantum relative entropy? Uh, so I take two states, rho and sigma. Actually, it's useful to, to have sigma not necessarily be a state, but just a positive operator. Okay, uh, uh, the, the definition works uh, equally well for that, the case. Rho, it's quite kind of important uh, that it, for it to be normalized, otherwise... Uh, 
there's many definitions you can come up with if rho is not normalized. But uh, for sigma is not normalized, this is fine. Uh, okay, so I take a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, and yeah, the quantum relative entropy is defined as follows. So trace of rho log rho minus log sigma. Okay, and so uh, if you see here, if you look a little bit at this quantity, you will see that uh, if the support of rho is included in the support of sigma, then this is well defined and, and there's no problem. But if it's not the case, uh, then you see there is a problem, right, between this lo log sigma and the rho. And so that's why we set it to plus infinity. Okay, so uh, just uh, yeah, recall that, um, uh, what, what do I mean by the log of an operator? I mean, you saw this several times, but let me repeat it in case. So I take the, the log of an operator is just, I take the log of its eigenvalues, okay? And, and I neglect, uh, or, or the, the zero eigenvalues, I completely remove them, okay? Okay, good, so the, yeah, so the classical case, again, it's uh, useful to look at the classical case. So, uh, yeah, when, when rho and sigma have this form, so they're written as the sum of px and uh, sum of qx and projector on x, then the, the relative entropy is just uh, uh, the sum of px log of px over qx. Okay, and this is, as you might expect, it's very well uh, studied in classical um, say probability theory and statistics. Uh, so um, it's called relative entropy, or sometimes it's called kullback leibler divergence. And you can see this quantum relative entropy as, as a quantum generalization of um, uh, the kullback leibler divergence. Okay? Uh, yeah, I can say here that, the, that this is one, uh, one generalization, one non-commutative generalization of the relative entropy, but there are actually others, okay? Um, but this one is the most uh, uh, most famous or mo most well uh, the most used. Okay, and actually one reason I would say it's the most used is exactly the Stein lemma that I that that I will show. Right. So because the Stein lemma does not have any divergence, it has this specific one. Okay. Uh, then this is uh, uh, why or, or one of the reasons. Let's say it's the most used. Even okay. So the paper that that proves this it's called the proper the proper generalization of the of uh, the relative entropy or something like this. It's a paper by Petz and Hiai, I believe. Hiai Petz. Uh, okay. Okay, good. So, yeah, before getting into the proof, let's see a few properties of this uh, quantum relative entropy. So, uh, uh, first, um, uh, so if I take two states, right, so if rho and sigma are both states, uh, then the relative entropy is, is non-negative. It's always non-negative, so it's a valid measure. And we have equality if and only if rho is equal to sigma. So in particular, if rho is equal to sigma, then it gives zero, uh, and it's zero only in this case. Okay, and so and, uh, uh, again, as I told you, what is the most important inequality is what the data processing. And um, this also holds for this... Uh, this um, uh, for, the, for this uh, relative entropy, and so yeah, if I apply a channel on the two sides, then uh, the quantity can only decrease. Okay, so as I said, so I won't prove this, even though we'll use it, actually. We'll use this in uh, the proof of the Stein's lemma. Uh, uh, I will only prove this tomorrow. This will actually be the objective of tomorrow's lecture, will be to prove this inequality. Okay, from quantum divergence. <coughs> So uh, this quantum divergence plays an important role uh, also because uh, you can uh, derive from properties of this quantum uh, relative entropy uh, properties of the von Neumann entropy, which you might be more familiar with. Um, so yeah, this you can see this relative entropy as a sort of parent quantity from which you can, you can get uh, the uh, von Neumann entropies. Okay, so how, how do you do that? Uh, so for a state, okay, for a bipartite state, rho AB, okay, you define uh, the, the von Neumann entropy, okay, this is the way I define it, okay, you can check that it corresponds to the usual definition, 
uh, you, can, you define it as minus, right? You put a minus sign between the relative entropy of rho A and uh, identity. Kay. So you might be wondering why this minus sign, what this minus sign is doing. We just saw that it's positive. But remember, it's positive only for if the states are normalized, if the operators are normalized. Here, identity is not normalized, right? So it's an identity. Um, okay, so, so in general, uh, this, will be, this quantity will actually will be negative. And so when I take the minus sign, uh, it gives me the, uh, the usual von Neumann entropy. Okay, so I can also define the conditional entropy as minus the relative entropy between identity on A tensor, the marginal on B. And uh, I can also define the mutual information, which is the relative entropy between rho AB and the product of the marginals. Okay, I mean, in, in the, I won't discuss this more uh, in this lecture, but in the tutorial, you'll play a bit with these entropies. To this will be useful for the following lectures. Okay, good. Uh, so I hope, yes. Is there an interpretation of these? Of these? Uh, no, I, I, I uh, uh, th there are, but, uh, but uh, this is, it will come, I mean, uh, so, I mean, we'll see one, maybe not, not very direct one, but uh, uh, in the fourth lecture, okay, on, on Thursday. But, but now I won't discuss it. I mean, okay, so the, the mutual information, at least, it, it has a natural one in terms of, right, so it's I in terms of this Stein's lemma, if you say I want to distinguish a state rho AB and the product of its marginals, and you can ask about the type 2 error for a fixed uh, type 1 error, then this gives an operational interpretation, right, if you want. But here, these also have other interpretations in terms of compression and things like this, but uh, like as in the classical setting, but we won't cover this in this, in the, in this course. Okay, good. So I hope this is clear. So now what I will try to do is uh, to try to do a proof of uh, uh, Stein's lemma. Uh, so now I, I will go a little bit more quickly. Maybe if you don't follow the, the all the details of the calculations, it doesn't matter so much. But maybe if you get the, the overall um, uh, idea of what the structure of the proof is, and then you, you can look back at the notes if you want to, to see the details. Um, okay, so again, recall the statement. The statement is, is as follows, so it, it, can written, it can be written in the following way. So it's, it's a limit. Um, <coughs> okay, good. So I have to show the two inequalities, right? So I have to show uh, this inequality, which I'll call an achievability result, which is to say that I can make the type 2 error sufficiently small. I can make the type 2 error of order e to 2 to the minus the relative entropy between rho and sigma. Okay, and then I, so this is what I will start with. Okay, and this is what we call achievability, is that I have to give you a strategy. Okay, and so what we'll do is we'll start with the case, the classical case, uh, where rho and sigma commute. Okay, so this is then a, a statement uh, uh, about uh, just probabilities. So, okay, so yeah, let's take the setting where I have rho and sigma, which have eigenvectors, uh, eigenvalues p and q respectively, and I take now tensor copies. So I take rho tensor n and sigma tensor n. Okay, then this naturally corresponds to the product distribution where uh, I take, um, uh, yeah, so, the, so the, the eigenvalues are just the product of the, of the corresponding eigenvalues. Uh, and then, so then I will have to define a test, right? So what is, what is my test for this problem? Okay, so I can see it classically. So that's, it's useful here to think classically. Uh, it's maybe simpler to, to think of a test in this case. So I see uh, n samples, x1 to xn. Again, either they come all from p or all from q. Okay, so I will compute, as I discussed before, I will compute this, this likelihood ratio. So I will, I will compute r and compute what is the probability that I have of seeing this particular sample I saw, right? So, so I, uh, what is the probability? It's p of x1 times p of x2, et cetera, times p of xn. Okay, and I divide it by what would be the probability if, if, the, if the distribution was q. Okay, and I just multiply them. Okay, and now I will have to just set the parameters. Uh, so, okay, so I will have to put my threshold. 
right? So remember, I told you that uh, we will put a threshold if R is bigger than something, I will say P. If R is smaller than something, I will say Q. Okay, so here it turns out that the right threshold to put so that we have the right errors is this, okay? So I will just uh, say 1 over n times the log of r is bigger than this quantity. Okay, and delta is a small parameter that will let go to 0 uh, at the end of the proof. Okay, so if, the, if this r is bigger than, than this threshold, uh, I say the samples are from p. Otherwise, I say that samples are from q. Okay, so... Um, so if you prefer to, okay, so this is a strategy that is explained in classical terms. Uh, if you pre prefer to use the quantum notation and the definition of the, of the optimization problem that I gave you for this uh, d uh, h uh, epsilon, the corresponding e um, has the following form, right? It's the sum over all the x1, xn, the projector onto x1, xn, of the particular x1 and xn's that have the right uh, such that the ratio of the of the probabilities is bigger than this threshold that I chose. Okay. Uh, good. Okay, so of course, yeah, I wrote here that of course this e depends on n. I didn't put it explicitly, but of course it depends on n. Okay, so now I have to analyze this test. Okay, and to say, okay, so what does it mean to analyze this test? Is I have so given a test. It defines uh, type 1 error probability and it defines type 2 error probability. So I just have to compute these two numbers now and to check that it's satisfied that the type 1 error probability is smaller than epsilon and the type 2 error probability is smaller than 2 to the minus n times the relative entropy. Okay, and so, uh, yeah, so I have to compute these two things. So let's, let's compute it. So it's, it's simpler here to compute the, the, this is the probability of success, right, rather than the probability of error. Okay, so if the samples are from P, so again, I mean hypothesis zero, then I just, uh, it's, it's useful here to use the, just the probability notation. Okay, if the threshold is bigger than D, and now I just uh, use uh, the, the fact that the P uh, and the Q are, uh, is a product distribution, so, and I write this as the sum of the logs of the probabilities, okay? And now you see that now uh, these random variables are uh, independent and identically distributed and they have an expectation, right? Uh, with, uh, I mean, remember that I'm in the case where the samples are from P here. It, they have an expectation which is given by the relative entropy between P and Q. Okay, and so uh, again, by the now by the law of large numbers, so this is a sum of independent random variables which have an expectation which is given by the relative entropy the probability that it's bigger than the relative entropy minus a little bit goes to one as, as, as n goes to infinity. Okay, so uh, yeah, so even the type, uh, th this ty or here I should say the type one success probability uh, goes to one as n goes to infinity. So in particular for large enough n, this will be bigger than one minus epsilon. Okay, good. Um, okay, so this was the first type uh, uh, of uh, type 1 error probability. Now I have to analyze the second uh, type of error probability. And now this I have to show that it, it goes down very quickly to, uh, uh, to 0 as a function of n. Okay, so, um, uh, right? So, yeah, I have to analyze this quantity. And so I, I just uh, uh, write it like this. So it's the sum over x1, xn of uh, the probability that these e the specific x1, xn's satisfy this condition, okay? So I, I wrote it in a slightly different notation here where I put the condition here. Um, okay, and if you just rewrite this condition, it just tells you that the product of the Qs is at most uh, some number, which is directly related to the threshold, uh, which is exactly the threshold that I, I fixed, or one over the threshold I fixed, uh, times the product of the Ps. Okay, so and then uh, what I do is I replace this product of Qs with this bound that I have, okay? And so this, this bound that I have stays, and then the sum over the P of, P of Xs um, uh, is at most one, or is equal to one here even, because I forgot the, the constraint that I had. Okay, and so I have that this uh, type two error probability is bounded by two to the minus N times the relative entropy. Okay, so here I just, uh, manipulation, I just take minus log of that, uh, it gives at least n times uh, the relative entropy, and so I get basically the desired statement. 
Okay, so I have for large enough n, 1 over n, the hypothesis testing relative entropy is at least the relative entropy between p and q. Okay, and then I let delta go to 0, and it's simple. Okay, good. So that was, uh, we did the classical case, achievability. Okay, classical achievability case. Okay, so now to finish the achievability, we have to, I, I only give you the classical case. Okay, so this is, how do I go to the quantum case now? Okay, so for that, uh, we'll use a, a technique which is uh, quite useful, uh, sometimes, I mean, uh, useful in, in, in quantum information theory. It's this uh, technique of, uh, called pinching. Okay, and it's a, it's a general way of reducing the non-commuting case to, to, the, to the commuting case. Okay, as we'll see, it's, uh, I mean, we, 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 we get some losses, but uh, at least for this particular problem, these losses, we can handle them. Okay, so what, what, uh, what, what does pinching mean? Um, okay, so what does pinching mean? It, it means, so, okay, so, I, I, uh, uh, so a pinching map is depending on some uh, Hermitian, op or let's say positive operator here, sigma, and I just do a spectral decomposition of uh, sigma, okay? So let's assume its eigenvalues are lambda, okay? So, um, uh, and uh, pi lambda is just a projector onto the eigenspace corresponding to lambda, okay? And uh, what I do here, uh, what this pinching map is, so it's, it's a quantum channel, it's a valid quantum channel, what it does is it takes an operator S and um, it maps it to the sum over lambda of P lambda, S times P lambda. Of course, here lambda is just in the spectrum of sigma. Uh, I didn't rewrite it again, but... Uh, yeah, so p, uh, p lambda is, is, is this one. Okay. So in, in some sense, I'm, uh, uh, so if I take these eigenspaces, what I'm doing is I'm removing the off-diagonal terms uh, that are uh, corresponding to, this, to these eigenspaces. Okay. So for example, if we imagine that pi lambdas are rank one projectors, so okay, they correspond to, to some... Uh, 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 projector, one-dimensional projectors, then this would mean what, what P sigma of S is doing is that it's removing all the, uh, the off-diagonal terms, okay? But notice that, and this is important, that the pi lambda are not necessarily rank one, right? They, they can be of, of uh, much bigger rank. And in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm removing the off-diagonals corresponding to, uh, so I have blocks, I have diagonal blocks, and I'm removing the off-diagonal blocks. Okay, good. So why is this useful? Why is this map useful? Uh, so the, the thing which is useful here is that notice that P sigma of S commutes with sigma. Okay, this is easy to see. You probably all see it directly, but you'll discuss this in more detail in the problem session. Okay, so, um, and uh, so, of course, it's easy to construct an operator that, that commutes with sigma alone, but we want another property that it retains some properties of the, of the operator that I apply the map to, right? And so this is quantified by this uh, operator inequality, right? It says that if I apply uh, uh, the pinching map relative to, with the, to the, to the uh, state or to the positive operator rho, then um, I cannot lose too much in the sense that this operator is at least uh, some quantity times rho. And this quantity, what does it depend on? It depends on the number of distinct eigenvalues of sigma, okay, or the size of the spectrum of sigma. Yes. Yes, I include it, yes. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so just uh, if, if uh, um, an eigenvalue appears several times, right, I don't include it multiple times. This is the key fact, yes. Uh, yes, I mean her mission, so that you have to diagonalize. But yeah, yes. Okay, good. So, so this is what I'll use. Okay, I see I'm, I'm a bit late on time. So, um, uh, let me go quickly. The important maybe is to see just the, the overview of this part. So, okay. So I start with rho and sigma, which in general don't commute. Okay. So I. I uh, so what I'll do is I'll uh, use the data processing inequality for uh, dh epsilon, and I apply pinching to the two uh, to, to the two sides. Okay, so I apply pinching relative to sigma tensor n to the two sides. Okay, so if I, of course, if I pinch a state relative, uh, uh, um, 
if I pinch relative to a state and apply it to the same state, it gives me the same state, right? So it doesn't do anything, okay? But of course, on row, it does do something, okay? But now the advantage is that here, these two states, they commute, okay? So now I'm in a classical case, right? So I, I can p pick an eigenbasis where both are diagonal, and so now everything is diagonal, and I can apply the, the, the classical theorem, the, the classical result that we saw um, before. Uh, okay, so, so yeah, so this is what I wrote here. So uh, this, uh, because these two commute, then this corresponds to the hypothesis testing between two uh, 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 probability vectors P and Q. Okay, so now uh, uh, if I use the, the classical result, that the classical achievability result that we ju have just seen now, if I take the limit as M, go M is different from N, huh? okay, so I have two, two of these parameters. So uh, I take the limit as M goes to infinity and I take multiple copies of P, I will get that this goes to the, uh, to the classical relative entropy between P and Q. Okay, good. So now how do I, uh, but okay, now this is not exactly what I wanted, right? I, uh, I, don't, I don't care about this, uh, this row after which I apply pinching. I want to get back row itself, right? So okay, so what do I do? Um, what we will do is this. So I will take, uh, I will apply the pinching to n copies of, of row, and then uh, I take that m times, okay? And then I use this result to get, um, uh, or okay, here I just, I just rewrote the statement. I just replaced this quantity by p and this quantity by q. And now I use this result here uh, to say that um, uh, uh, this is at least, I mean, here it's, uh, it's just this inequality at least. This is what we're interested in. This goes to like the one over n stays and the relative entropy comes from uh, here, this inequality. Okay, and now I can again go back from the, the, the probability vector to the uh, to the corresponding quantum states, okay, commuting quantum states, okay, and uh, then I want to get back. Now I have a relative entropy, so it's good. I don't have a hypothesis testing relative entropy, but but the usual relative entropy. But what I want to do is I want to get rid of this uh, pinching operator. And so now I, here is where I will use this uh, pinching property. The second pinching property is that uh, if I uh, apply this pinching to row tensor n then this is at least one over the size of the spectrum of sigma tensor n times rho tensor n. Okay, and now the, the, the important thing to observe is that what, is, what can I say on the size of the spectrum of sigma tensor n? Right, so notice that the, that the eigenvalues of sigma tensor n are, are of the form I take a product of eigenvalues uh, of sigma, right? But how many different eigenvalues are there, right? So I can count for each eigenvalue how many times it appears, right? And uh, so how many times it appears is between some number between zero and n, right? So I have n plus one possibilities, and this is for each one of the eigenvalues, okay? So that's why the, the number of different eigenvalues is at most n plus one, it's because it's either zero, one, two, up to n, and uh, I have at most d of them, d where d is the underlying dimension, so it's to the power d, or d minus one, because the last one you can uh, uh, infer it from the others. Okay, good. So that's good, because this quantity now uh, is, that I have one over some polynomial in n times rho tensor n. Okay. And this is what is the crucial here, is that it's polynomial in n, and not exponential. Okay, and so now, uh, uh, so if I look back at my, now my relative entropy between uh, the pinched rho tensor n and the sigma tensor n, okay, I can use some, uh, I can do some basic manipulations with this, uh, with this pinching and the, the, the operator monotonicity of the log here, right? To use now, okay, so, uh, yeah, le let's, let's go directly here, okay, so I have log rho tensor n times log of p sigma uh, rho tensor n. And I want to replace this by rho tensor n. But remember yesterday in the problem session, you saw that log is operator monotone, right? So uh, uh, the I have, so this, this operator inequality, if I apply the log to it, it still holds, right? And so uh, this is where I can replace this p sigma of rho with just rho tensor n, but I will lose some factor. This, uh, uh, I mean, here it should be divided by the spectrum 
of sigma tensor n. But of course, yeah, log of the product is the sum of the logs, and so I can get this uh, minus log outside. Okay, so uh, globally, what, what, what did we do? So um, uh, if we put this together, we have uh, 1 over n, the relative entropy, after applied the pinching, uh, is at least 1 over n, the relative entropy, before apply the pinching, minus some uh, loss term here. But this loss term is very reasonable because this thing is polynomial in n, and I, I take the log and then I divide by 1 over n, so this thing goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Okay, so notice that one thing I used here that I didn't, uh, that you might wonder about is here, I used the fact that this quantity is additive. So the, the quantum relative entropy uh, on tensor powers, it's the sum of the relative entropy. Okay, this is relatively easy to check. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I included the, the idea here of how to show this. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so I hope this was uh, clear. So I have two minutes remaining. Um, so maybe it's not worth doing the, the converse. Or maybe I, okay, I do it very quickly, the converse, let's say, in two minutes. Right? So, um, okay, so for the converse, actually, we'll prove something slightly weaker. We'll not prove the, the full result. Right? I only prove that uh, this was sometimes it's called a weak converse. I'll just prove that if I take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, uh, then this gives me the relative entropy. Okay? But it is true that it works for any epsilon. This is what is called a strong converse. Uh, but, uh, but here it's, uh, I mean, we need to introduce some new tools in order to do that. And so I, I thought it's simpler to just focus on this. Okay, and so, so the, the main idea, if you want to prove that, is just uh, applying data processing. Okay, so it's a very simple proof. The main thing that you do is just apply data processing inequality okay, to the right map. Okay, and so what is this map uh, so that will apply the data processing inequality to? It's the following um, map. So, right, okay, so, uh, yeah, maybe I should. So what, what do I mean by converse, right? So I want to prove the opposite inequality, right? So, and, and what is a converse? It's a sort of no-go result. It's saying that if I take any valid strategy, then the type 2 error cannot be too small, right? It cannot be uh, too small, okay? So uh, what I have to do is I take an arbitrary strategy E, okay, which uh, has to satisfy this. This is by, by construction, by definition of what a strat valid strategy is, okay? And um, I will apply now the data processing inequality for a well-chosen quantum channel, which depends, of course, on the strategy. And uh, so, so how, how, what is this channel doing is it's mapping uh, uh, an operator T into the following. So if it, of, it will, of course, depend on the strategy that I look at. So um, uh, I will just output 0 with probability trace of E times T. And I will output 1 with uh, the like 1 minus this probability. Okay, so you can see that if I apply E to this channel, then I will observe easily all the types of error probabilities so the, and, and the success probabilities, right? And, uh, okay, so and wha what will we do now is we'll say that on one side, I'll just compute this quantity, right? The relative entropy between rho tensor N and sigma tensor N, okay? So it's, it's just by uh, additivity, it's equal to N times the relative entropy between rho and sigma. And on the other hand, uh, I can find a lower bound on this quantity by using data processing. Right? So I apply this previous map, E, and what this allows me to do is it allows me to give a lower bound on this relative entropy as a function of the type 1 and type 2 error probabilities, right? Because remember, uh, this is the case, and so I, I just do that, and uh, yeah, by just then doing some simple uh, computations, uh, we get the desired result. Okay, let me just uh, finish with a, with a very quick remark um, on, on uh, what this quantity is. So the reason I wanted to, to define uh, a specific quantity for this task and call it a divergence, this d epsilon h, because um, this is uh, done a lot in, in information theory and, and such quantities are sometimes called one-shot entropies or one-shot relative entropies. And uh, they're usually measures that have an operational interpretation for any states, 
for any choice of states. So for example, here, it has an operational interpretation directly in terms of this hypothesis testing problem. Okay, and there are many others that are particularly relevant in settings where, where you want measures that work for any states, not necessarily for specific classes of, of states. And so in particular, one very important one is sometimes called the mean entropy or the, the smooth mean entropy, which is particularly relevant in cryptography. Okay, and these, uh, these uh, entropy measures that you might be more uh, used to, the, like the von Neumann entropy and the corresponding relative entropy, they usually have an operational interpretation when we're in a setting, when, when we're in an IID setting, like, uh, like exactly what we saw in this lecture. Remember, we have rho tensor n and sigma tensor n, and we want to, to characterize the, the, the type 1, type 2 uh, uh, error probabilities in this case, okay? Uh, in this IID setting or in the average setting. Um, okay, and I'll stop here for today. Sorry for being a bit long. Mm. Okay.